It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Speaker, there's no better place to live than in Ontario. And it's one of the reasons I came here from Newfoundland so many years ago and why I chose to stay to raise a family here. Ontario has always held great promise and great opportunity, but, Speaker, there's a really growing sense out there that things aren't quite right. People are struggling to pay rent and keep food on the table, and some are being forced to leave their communities or even the province just to be able to find an affordable place to live. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Why did his budget contain virtually no measures to help make life more affordable in this province? And to apply, the government has to do. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'm glad to hear that the Leader of the Opposition is as optimistic about the province of Ontario as we have been since 2018, Mr. Speaker. In fact, just earlier this week, the Opposition was continuing to talk down the province of Ontario. But let's look at what we have done, Mr. Speaker. We didn't just start this year. We started back in 2018 to reverse what was a disastrous time frame when both the Liberals and the NDP systematically increased the costs on the people of the province of Ontario. We started in 2018 to cut taxes for people. We took the most vulnerable right off the tax rolls entirely. They voted against those measures, Mr. Speaker. We're continuing with the gas tax uh, uh, rebate. Of course, they voted against that, Mr. Speaker. We've reduced the costs for our small, medium, and large job creators by over eight billion dollars. The results have been Us? that over 600,000 people in the province of Ontario now have the dignity of the job that didn't when they shared power with the Liberals, and we have 300,000 jobs that still need to be filled. That's good news for the people. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, the thing is that if you're a friend to the Premier or Conservative insider, you've got a direct line to this government, but for your average Ontarian? There's little in the way of help in this budget or anywhere else. In just a couple of days, rent is going to come due again for millions of people in this province. And thanks to this government's massive loopholes in rent control, people are seeing a steep and sudden increase in their rent. Speaker, back to the Premier. With people feeling so squeezed by the costs that are out of control, why didn't he use the budget to bring back real rent control and give Ontarians some relief? How can the Leader of the Opposition talk about the costs on the people of the province of Ontario when this is a party that supports year after year federal policies which increase the cost of a carbon tax? Now let's, let's unpack that for a second because we said and we have continued to say that a carbon tax will cost the people of the province of Ontario on every single thing that they do, driving to work more expensive, going to get groceries more expensive, the groceries that you buy in the store more expensive because of a carbon tax. And This is a party that supports a 14 per cent increase in the carbon tax on April 1st, Mr. Speaker. So I ask the Leader of the Opposition, will she join with us in asking the federal government to, at the very least, at the very least, pause that incredible Response. increase on the costs of everything for the people of the province of Ontario. Will she put her money where about this? Stop the clock. Members will please take their seats. Order. Restart the clock. Final supplementary. It's time this government started to take a little bit of responsibility for the fact that life is a lot harder for a lot of people in this province five years after they came to, to power. Yeah. I'd really encourage the Premier and all his ministers to get out of the back rooms and start listening to real people, because people are really Order. struggling. Order. And I hear it Order. everywhere I go. Government side, it's come not Order. just rent that's through the roof, it's more expensive than ever before to buy a home. This government's plan to build luxury homes on protected land is not going to solve that problem. Speaker, my question to the Premier is, will he act to end greedy land speculation and make sure the dream of truly affordable home ownership is no longer out of reach? Yeah. House Leader. Mr. Speaker, when we, in our first uh, mandate, brought in transit-oriented communities to build 
more homes around the incredible infrastructure that we are building across the province of Ontario, and not just in Toronto, but in communities across Toronto that have GO train stations. The Leader of the Opposition, how did she vote? She voted against yep. that measure, Mr. Speaker. This is thousands of homes, affordable housing for the people of the province of Ontario. Now, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing has been working since day one to bring more housing to Ontario, and they have voted against every single measure. Now, as I said last week, the opposition, the federal government, they can either support us in bringing more homes to the people of the province of Ontario so that more people can share in the dream of home ownership, whether it's to own a home, whether it's your first rental, more people want to share in that dream. You can either help us or simply get out of the way. Order. The next question. Order. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Again, Speaker, totally out of touch. Not listening to the Order. real people of this province. Order. Speaker, there's a whole bunch of senior clock. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. The last the Leader of the Opposition to take your seat. Oh, I'm, I'm up. Please take your seat. But stop the clock. The government side will come to order so that I can hear the member who is asking the questions. Start the clock. Leader of the Opposition. Let's talk about a real person, Speaker. Speaker, this week, CBC News shared the story of an Ontario senior who was charged almost $9,000 in unnecessary fees for eye surgery at a private clinic. And when she started asking questions about it, the clinic threw her out. Yeah. Lois Cooper is speaking out now after hearing the Premier and Minister of Health repeat over and over and over again that patients will not have to pay more in private surgical facilities. Her experience and that of so many others shows that just trust us isn't going to protect patients. Speaker to the Premier, will this government refuse that it, will this government refuse to put uh, sorry, I'm gonna start that again. Will this government stop the predatory upselling that is happening across this province. To reply, Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Health, Member. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. This government is actually making changes through Bill 60, which, if passed, will be expanding oversight and patient protection when it comes to people's health. And for some reason, the members opposite don't seem to want to expand those patient protections. They don't seem to want to support Bill 60, but I hope they will, because Bill 60 has a whole bunch of protections in it to address situations such as this. For example, any community health centre in the future uh, will have to post any uninsured charges both online and in person so people know ahead of time. They'll have to have a process for receiving and responding to patient complaints. And patients cannot be denied access to a treatment if they don't purchase uninsured services. Spons? Finally, we're also expanding oversight to the patient ombudsman to include these new centres. All of these things are in place to help patient protections. I would think the members opposite would support that. Supplementary. What oversight? What protection? It's not there. That's not, that's not right. Mountains of evidence show patients have been repeatedly misled by for-profit clinics that have recommended procedures that people just don't need. It's how they make a profit. This government's Health Act is going to do nothing to stop this. So we, we have proposed amendments speaker to outlaw upselling in any form speaker to the minister of health will the minister accept the ndp's amendments to protect patients parliamentary assistant minister of health Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite. The whole point of this legislation is to change the model that was a model of independent health facilities into a model of integrated community health centres, bringing the new health centres and the old ones, 900 of which have been operating across the province for 30 years under all 
kinds of governments, NDP, Liberal and Conservative, uh, to change that model to make them integrated under Ontario Health, under the auspices of Ontario Health, and with direction, which is centrally controlled, centralized waitlist management. This is a significant improvement. It will improve access to patient care, and this government is all about doing that, making sure patients get the care they need quickly and make sure they get their lives back as soon as possible. The final supplementary. No, Speaker, Bill 60. Bill 60 is going to make it legal to put pay profits ahead of patients in this province. That's what it's going to do. Speaker, it is absolutely critical for Ontarians to believe that their government is acting in their best interest. Ms. Cooper's experience shows us how patients will suffer under Bill 60 because private for-profit clinics are going to upsell and cherry-pick their patients. Private for-profit clinics, some of which just happen to be major Conservative Party yeah. donors. Yeah. Speaker, to, to the Minister of Health, who is making health policy in this province? Your donors? When will someone start putting people like Lois first? Parliamentary Assistant, Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite. In fact, that is what this government is doing, putting people like Lois first, putting patients in Ontario first. We know the status quo is not working, and that is why we are innovating. And There's nothing in Bill 60 which talks about any particular model of care. For example, we had the Ken Kensington Eye Institute come in. Kensington Eye Institute would be a model that could, could be under this Bill 60. They could be the kind of, of place that gets established. For Brampton North Eye Clinic order. has been giving great care to patients for many years and will continue to do so. So we can continue to build out models, make sure that they are serving patients, make sure patients are getting the care they need in a timely way by the best possible experts who can provide that care. That is what Bill 60 is about, patient access quickly. Next question, the member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. The Old Forge Community Resource Centre in my riding of Ottawa, West Nepean, provides crucial supports to seniors and people living with disabilities that allows them to lead healthy, independent lives and stay out of the hospital. But they've been trying to survive on 2012 funding levels while demand for services is going up. They begged this government for a budget increase, but to no avail. Now, starting Monday, 95 seniors and people with disabilities will go without services because of this government's inaction. Why is the Premier willing to let such vulnerable people lose such vital supports? Reply on behalf of the government, the government House Speaker. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In fact, uh, just the opposite. Since this government has been in place, we have been systematically be, uh, re, uh, revamping our services for not only our seniors, but for our most vulnerable across the province. That is why we started off by ensuring that the lowest uh, lowest income earning people were removed from the tax rolls altogether. But when you look at the improvements that uh, the minister is making with respect to senior care, not only in this current budget where we increased access to uh, uh, the guaranteed uh, income uh, income supplement, the uh, uh, the incredible investments that we are making in home care, the investments that we are making in uh, in uh, in long term care. But we've also heard from our seniors that they also want the opportunity where 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 they can to participate in an, in the economy, in the growing economy. The minister of labour has making that available to them as well. The Minister of Education, through COVID, ensured that those seniors and retired teachers, for instance, who wanted to come back and help us through the pandemic could do that. So it's more than just, it's more than just looking at seniors as exiting uh, the, uh, the workforce. It's more than looking at them as exiting uh, their, their time to participate. It's about how we can integrate them into helping us continue to build an Ontario that they left us, a thriving Ontario that they almost destroyed, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. I'm sure the seniors in the Dementia Day program that's being cut will be really happy to know this government is willing to let them work. Speaker, it's not just the old forge. 30 community social service organizations in eastern Ontario are faced with the same challenge and will have to make cuts thanks to this government's decision. Hospital CEOs in eastern Ontario called on the Premier to support these organizations because they know these organizations keep people out of hospitals with preventative health care and that they help people get home sooner with Meals on Wheels and home care. Just $7 million would allow these organizations to maintain their service levels. Will the Premier listen to the hospital CEOs and properly fund these organizations? 
Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, it is, it is interesting to hear the opposition now talking about supporting the hospital CEOs, right? It's just another example of say one thing when the camera's on and do something else. Now, when the hospital CEOs in September asked us to do more to help those seniors who were in hospitals and needed to be in long-term care or other options, the opposition suggested that people would be sent thousands of miles away and they would be bankrupted by the policies that that's what the hospital CEOs asked. And what happened? In fact, just the opposite, Mr. Speaker. When I tour long term care homes, the residents there say it's the best thing that ever happened. The quality of care is much better. Why? Because we listen to the hospital CEOs. When the hospital CEOs told us that we had to do better on small, medium sized hospitals' budgets, we did that. When the hospital CEOs in Ontario and Eastern Ontario and Ottawa and said we needed new hospitals, we came through. When they said that they needed more staff, the Minister of Colleges and Universities came through with a program that is hiring thousands of nurses. When they needed more doctors, the Minister of the Treasury Board came through. Thank you. Thank you. The next question. The member for Barry Innisfil. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Education. As we know, rising inflation costs continue to impact the financial well-being of families and businesses across the province, and certainly in the riding of Barry Innisfil. And the on upcoming tax increase of the carbon tax of 14% uh, will also uh, hinder those families. I've heard resoundingly throughout the riding of Barry Innisfil they can't afford the rising cost of inflation. They increased carbon tax on April. 1st. They're happy to see that our government is doing what we can to keep costs low and, of course, to fight the federal government on the tax increase. But, Speaker, what I'm also hearing is hope from parents. Hope from parents that finally they're seeing direct supports for them through this government. And I was speaking to Melissa, a mom of three, who's benefiting from catch-up payments. So I'm going to ask the Minister of Education, what else is he hearing from parents in terms of the direct financial supports this government is giving to families and students? And to respond, the Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Barry Innisville for her leadership in this House, standing up for families against the regressive federal liberal carbon tax that is raising the cost on all families and all small businesses in this economy. Mr. Speaker, in addition to opposing that carbon tax by the federal government, we are also providing direct financial relief to parents. In fact, we have done it three times, $1.9 billion over the past three years in direct financial relief to parents to help support them and their kids get back on track. We just unveiled Ontario's catch-up payments. I'm proud to confirm 80 percent of parents have signed up for this $200 payment for every child under 18 and $250 for every child with special education needs. Now, there's still 20 percent of parents who have it, and I'm encouraging all members to promote this investment. Ontario.ca forward slash catch up payments apply today get the relief families deserve and supplementary question member for Barry Innisfil. Thank you, and I want to thank the minister for really understanding the needs of families and students alike. And we know, following many years of disruption, our students return to the classroom in person, where they know they can best recover their academic, mental, and physical health. But our students also need the right investments and supports in order to realize their recovery and prepare them for the success in a modern economy. This means ensuring our students are learning critical life skills and job skills that are rooted in fundamentals and topics like math, reading and writing, something you hear a lot from parents. Ontario students need these skills to find lifelong careers and help us continue to grow our provincial economy. So I want to ask the minister, with all the work that he's also doing, how is he investing in our students so they can be successful in the classroom and for years beyond the classroom? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I do appreciate this question. In Budget 2023, we've reaffirmed our commitment to publicly funded schools. We increased investments for Ontario children by $2.3 billion overall. Even on a baseline evaluation, it's up $1.3 billion in the year prior. Now, Mr. Speaker, we know there's more to do. It's why we launched a tutoring program, $175 million focused on getting back to the fundamentals and the basics of education, lifting up reading, writing, and math scores, and refocusing the system back on strengthening skills development in our school system. We have a modern curriculum mandating financial literacy and coding and transferable hands-on learning that we know is critical for these young people to succeed in the economy. And finally, Speaker, we're expanding the skill trades and technology opportunities, requiring students to now take a tech course starting next September, opening up their horizons and their opportunities to get good-paying jobs in this economy. Bonds? Thank you. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. 
Over 98,000 people have signed online petitions calling for a vulnerable person alert. Today, I'm joined by the family of Draven Graham, the Ontario Autism Coalition, and the Alzheimer Society of Ontario, who came here to support Bill 74. Bill 74, if passed, would provide police forces with an additional tool to bring our vulnerable loved ones who go missing home. Time is critical in these situations, and a vulnerable person's alert would provide a useful solution to help protect people. Currently, Bill 74 has been referred to the Standing Committee on Justice Policy. Can the Premier provide us with a date on when this bill will be studied before the committee? The government house leader. I, I thank the member for the question. Uh, as uh, she uh, said, uh, acknowledged this morning in her news conference uh, uh, with uh, the parents and the grandparents, uh, the bill that was presented to the House was uh, significantly flawed, and had it gone to second reading today, we would not have been able to make the changes that uh, the member herself suggests needs to be made in order to make the bill effective. Uh, uh, speaker. So that is why we took the unusual and aggressive uh, uh, step, given that there is broad-based uh, support uh, for this, uh, to send it directly to committee so that the changes that the member herself acknowledges need to be made could actually be made and a bill could be supported. Uh, I did communicate this to the member and to the uh, opposition uh, uh, House Leader on the day that uh, we took that step to move it directly uh, to committee, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, again, it is our intention to do everything possible to make a flawed bill, although one that is presented, I suspect, in, in, in an honest, uh, good spirit, uh, to make it better so that it actually works for the parents of those uh, of those who, have, who are here today and all of those who are watching and want us to make a, an appropriate change. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the government house leader for that answer. Bill 74 looks to fill a gap in our current emergency alert system. Speaker, did you know that six in 10 people with dementia will wander? A vulnerable person alert could expand the demographic of vulnerable, vulnerable people, uh, so the alert would be broadened uh, to ensure that people who wander uh, would be brought home and it would save lives. Uh, so can the government House leader uh, commit to bringing Bill 74 back from committee after changes are made so that it can be debated and passed into legislation as quickly as possible? Government House Leader. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, uh, I, I think that the member knows quite well that uh, uh, with respect to private members' business, uh, this government uh, and uh, in the last parliament in particular and in this parliament has been very aggressive ensuring that uh, private members' business, when it is done in appropriate fashion, when the bill is, is a good bill, when it does have a broad level of support between, uh, uh, on all sides of the House, that we, that we do. Order. Despite the uh, uh, despite the hecklings of the Liberal Party, which does not seem to want to talk about this particular bill, you have my assurances that when the bill is fixed uh, uh, at committee, we will bring it back to the House because, as I said, there is a broad level of support uh, for the bill, and I think I know the member for Sarnia. Uh, Lampton. Sarnia Lampton uh, also had uh, talked about some uh, things that he'd like to see in this uh, as well, so it is our intention to do just that. The next question, the member for Markham Unionville. Speaker, my question is for the minister. Stop the clock. The member for Beaches East York will come to order. The government house leader will come to order. Minister of Labour will come to order. Minister, the member for Kitchener-Conestoga will come to order. Start the clock. The member for Markham Unionville. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Every day in Ontario, jobs go unfilled because of a shortage of workers. One senior economist recently said, there's a traffic jam of employers looking to hire. Information from Statistics Canada show record high job vacancy numbers and unprecedented labor force participation rate. To combat the labor shortage and to maintain Ontario's economic competitive position within the global market, we need more skilled workers than ever before. So, Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is addressing 
our labour shortage needs. Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Thank you very much, and thank you to the member uh, from Arkham Union, Unionville for that uh, very important question. Uh, speaker, our government knows that welcoming uh, economic immigrants who have the skills we need is crucial to building a strong Ontario. In 2021, the Premier and I called on the federal government to double the number of immigrants we can select. I'm pleased to share that the federal government met us at the table and together we got it done. Our immigrant nominee program will be doubling in size, allowing us to nominate over 18,000 immigrants by 2025. Speaker, last year we nominated 3,900 skilled trades workers, 2,200 software and IT workers, 1,000 truck drivers, and nearly 100 nurses and PSWs. Doubling this program by 2025 Response. means we can select more workers with these skills to fill gaps in industries that need them most. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the Minister for that response. That's a good news. It's welcome news that Ontario is getting a greater say in how we are addressing key labour shortage across province through our immigration immigrant nominee program. To support our province economic growth and to provide a foundation for next generation, we need to do everything we can do to get the workers that our province needs. It's also necessary to highlight that our government must consider the importance of these newcomers settled and build their lives in Ontario. Urgent labour mm -hmm. demands are present across our province, including regions outside major cities. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our government will ensure that communities Question. indeed have the ability to fulfil critical labour shortages? The Minister of Labour. Thank you, and thank you to the member again uh, for his leadership and, and for this question. Uh, speaker, we know that all parts of Ontario benefit from the skills and hard work of economic immigrants. Uh, that is why our immigrant nominee program prioritizes those looking to move to communities outside of the Greater Toronto Area. To ensure these professionals can start working as quickly as possible, Budget 2023 is investing $25 million over the next three years for security and IT upgrades. Through our first Working for Workers Act, uh, we remove discrimina discriminatory barriers that hold back internationally trained professionals and we're recognizing their credentials. Our mission is very simple, Speaker. We're going to build a stronger Ontario for the next generation. The next question, the member for Hamilton Centre. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, homelessness is a disability justice issue. We've known for years that people without housing are disproportionately disabled, many with multiple health conditions. This week, a report indicated that from June to November 2022, 22 people died in Hamilton while homeless. Harm reduction strategies include community mental health services, crisis supports, and drug overdose supports, uh, which are all inadequately resourced. When when people end up on the street, our responses to their complex needs cannot be to criminalize homelessness and then to ignore them in death. Mr. Speaker, the government's budget proves that they do not understand the urgency of this issue. When will the government take real steps to end homelessness in Ontario? Can you please take your seat? And respond. Mr. Mayor. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Speaker, I, I want to thank the member for uh, Hamilton Centre for her first question in the House. You know, Speaker, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot of things that the member opposite has said that I fundamentally disagree with, but there's one thing that I think she can agree with me on, and that's we got a great mayor in Hamilton. <laughs> we got a great mayor in Hamilton who has signed on to our housing pledge to build 47,000 homes in the city over the next 10 years. But again, Speaker, I, I fundamentally disagree with her characterization of our budget. Our budget stands up for the homelessness prevention program. It stands up for those wraparound services that mayors Huge. like the mayor of Hamilton have asked for. Huge. It directly responds uh, to the big city mayors that includes Hamilton, Response. we will continue to work with mayors like Andrea Horvath on meeting our housing target. Yeah. Yeah. And 
The supplementary question, back to the member for Hamilton Centre. Mr. Speaker, we're receiving continuous reports in Hamilton that those who died had contact with the system just prior to their death. Of the 22 who died, five were seen in an emergency room, two were discharged from hospital, three were released from jail, and four were prevented from accessing the shelter system. This patchwork system does not work. People are best supported in long term when they have access to fixed permanent housing as an important form of harm reduction. Affordable housing with full access to tenant legal protections is critically important because it's a basic human need and it's under the prevention jurisdiction. Again, to the Premier, people are dying in this budget won't end homelessness in Hamilton. When will the government take this problem seriously? Thank you, Speaker. It is my honour to stand up for the first time as the Associate Minister of Housing. I'd also like to congratulate the member on her election. Speaker, all members in this House want to prevent homelessness in this province, but this is a government that has taken real action. The $202 million investment announced in the budget has been well received by organizations right across Ontario. And I'll quote, housing is a human right and everyone deserves a safe and affordable place to call home. While we work toward that goal, the Ontario Alliance to End Homelessness is pleased to see this significant investment in homelessness services from the Government of Ontario. Speaker, I really do hope the opposition joins us and supports our investments. But, Speaker, you know what? There are shovels in the ground across this province building more non-profit and affordable housing thanks to the changes we've made under the More Homes Built Faster Act 2022. <laughs> Unfortunately, the opposition would rather tax those. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The affordability crisis is hitting Ontario families hard. The price of everything has gone up. Groceries have gone up. Rents have gone up. Interest rates have gone up. The Order. price of hydro, folks, it's higher than Order. it's ever been. And families work hard every day. Every day they, work hard and they feel like they're working, that they're falling further and further behind. They're looking for something to make their lives just a little bit easier. And when they see this budget, they can't find anything to make their lives just a little bit easier. In fact, there are things the government isn't doing in our schools and in health care that's actually making life harder for them. Instead of making people's lives just a little bit easier, this government is actually making life harder. So, Speaker, to the Premier, just why is that? And to reply, the Parliamentary Assistant Minister of Finance, Member for Bruce Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the people of Ontario work hard, and we understand that taxpayers are under pressure. Yep. That's why we took action last year in many areas when costs were riding yep. to keep costs down. With the temporary gas tax cut that we confirmed in the fall economic statement, made permanent, and yet the opposition voted against those both times. That's why this government is taking a targeted approach, and we're supporting people while building a strong Ontario for the future. We're investing in Ontario's workers with an additional $224 million to the Skills Development Fund to get workers into those well-paying jobs. We've increased health funding $15.3 billion over three years to, to, uh, and building 50 new hospital projects, expansions and Response. renovations. We're doing that right now. We have the right plan. We're taking a responsible, prudent approach to address the economic challenges and support the people of Ontario. Thank you. And supplementary question. Speaker, the Premier's message to families is you're on your own. If your child has exceptional needs that aren't being met at school, guess what, folks? You're on your own. If your child is struggling with their mental health and is falling behind in class, government side guess what? Order. you're on your own. You know what? If your child is on the autism spectrum, guess what, folks? You're on your own. If you're too sick to go to work, what, folks? You're on your own. And if you're one of the two million people, two million people in Ontario who don't have a family physician or a nurse practitioner, guess what, folks? You're on your own. If you Partner. own lots of land in the Greenbelt, guess what, folks? Premier's got your back. Order. Speaker, through you, why is this government abandoning Ontario's families 
in an affordability crisis. Government House Leader to reply. Is the leader of the Liberal Party kidding me? So let's let, let's take a look. Let's take a look. Under the leader, under the leadership or the lack thereof of the Liberals, we lost 300,000 jobs, and they wanted to transition to a service economy. In fact, Fiat Chrysler Order. said this was the worst jurisdiction in the world in which to do business under the Liberals. The highest amount of red tape under the Liberals. Inability to get transit and transportation under the Liberals. Our hospitals crumbling under the Liberals, Mr. Speaker. It, energy prices. He talks about energy prices. Are you Order. kidding me? Under the Liberals, people could not afford. They had to make a decision between heating Order. and eating. And this member has the nerve to get up and talk about affordability. Stop the clock. It seems somewhat strange that I can't hear the government house leader because of the heckling from the government side, and the government house leader is answering the question. Does he have more time? He has time. Okay. Order. Order. Start the clock. Government House Leader has a few more seconds. So, Mr. Speaker, let me just say this. If the member really wants to do something about affordability, then he can join us in calling on the federal government, supported by the NDP, to at least pause the 14 per cent increase in the carbon tax, hitting the people of the province of Ontario on April 1st. Okay. Okay. The House will come to order. Members will please take their seats. House will come to order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Halliburton, Court of Lakes Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. While it is positive and welcome news that our Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program will be doubling in size to expand our workforce, we must recognize that newcomers can be exposed to the risk of exploitation at work. Human trafficking and exploitation are horrendous crimes that often go unreported. Sadly, these crimes are still happening in Canada and here in Ontario. Traffic exploitation exists in many forms and takes advantage of systemic issues such as poverty, inequity, employer discrimination, unsafe working conditions, and gaps in employment policy. Regardless of the cause, the outcomes are devastating, resulting in physical, psychological, and emotional trauma to victims. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is protecting vulnerable Question. workers from labour exploitation? Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Thank uh, the member from Halliburton, Kortha Lakes Brock, for this very important question, but most of all for her leadership uh, when it comes to anti human trafficking in the province of Ontario. On behalf of all MPs, thank you for all the work that you've done. Speaker, our government stands in support of workers, whether you are a Canadian citizen or a temporary foreign worker. We will not tolerate actions by employers who abuse workers. That is why our government introduced the Working for Workers Act 2023, which would, if passed, continue to lead the country in providing groundbreaking protections for our workers. Part of the legislation identifies changes that are necessary to strengthen protections for vulnerable workers by establishing the highest maximum fines in Canada. Our message to dishonest and unethical employers is that if you think you're going to deny someone's basic human rights by withholding their passport or essential work documents, you will face very serious consequences. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for his dedication and tremendous work on this file. 
The Working for Workers Act is a positive step toward cracking down on exploitation and ensuring that the rights of everyone who is working here in Ontario is protected. However, we know from police reports that labour trafficking and abuse of vulnerable workers happens far too often. The reality is that victims are often in precarious work situations and are afraid to come forward. Under the strong leadership of the Premier and this minister, our government is committed to the safety, health and well-being of workers. While Ontario needs workers to strengthen and grow our province, workers need our government to make sure they are protected. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how this legislation, if passed, would implement and enforce measures to protect vulnerable workers? Minister of Labour. Again, to the member, thank you for this uh, question. Speaker, for employers who abuse workers, our government will hold them to account for their actions. The consequences will be swift and severe. Currently, labour inspectors can levy penalties of only $250 for each passport or work permit that is withheld, but with the proposed changes, that will rise to $200,000. As well, Speaker, if an individual employer is convicted by the courts of such an offence, they would also be subject to a fine of up to half a million dollars, up to 12 months in jail, or both. Additionally, corporations could be fined up to $1 million. Speaker, through these measures, all workers in Ontario can be assured that their safety is our number one priority and that we have their backs. Thank you. The next question, the member for London West. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, Barbara Savage is 84 years old and lives in London West. She recently received a sudden and shocking diagnosis of stage 4 breast cancer and underwent a double mastectomy in February. With tubes dangling everywhere from her chest, she was discharged and told a nurse would come to her home the next day. Speaker, 11 days later, a nurse finally came. With when the tubes filled with blood, Barbara's daughter had to Google how to drain them herself. Speaker, does the Premier believe that this is an acceptable standard of home care? Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. No, I mean, this is an unacceptable situation. Uh, this should not have happened, and I feel uh, very badly for that person who waited 11 days for someone to come and see them. Our government has made significant investments into home care. A, a strong home and community uh, care sector is critical to our government's plan to end hallway health care and build a patient-centered connected system. And that's why uh, a few years ago, I think last year, we had, um, invested in additional billion dollars to improve the quality of care and keep people of Ontario in their homes longer with the care that they need. And uh, we like the model at the South Lake uh, Hospital, South Lake at Home, which has the home care provider meeting with the, uh, the person who's going to receive the care in the hospital so they can meet the doctor, the nurse, get the discharge papers, and so that person will know that the person will be there and when. And so we want to make sure that that's the kind of system we have across Ontario so people get home care, which is appropriate, and can stay out of hospital and get well. The supplementary question. Speaker, Barbara Savage's case is not unique. The revolving door of staff in private, for-profit home care agencies has left patients like Barbara on their own. When Barbara and her daughter frantically called Paramed, they were told no nurses were available. Thankfully, Barbara did not develop complications, but many patients do, forcing them back into the hospital. Speaker, will this government admit that its failure to address the home care worker shortage, its refusal to drop the unconstitutional Bill 124 is putting the health of Ontarians like Barbara at risk. Parliamentary Assistant, the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you again to the member opposite. As this government has said many times, the only thing better than care close to home is care at home. And in partnership with hospitals, primary care, and on our, our Ontario health teams, Ontario is expanding and improving access to home and community care. Through the 2022 budget, the government announced the plan to invest a billion dollars over three years to get more people connected to care in the comfort of their own home. But our government is now, through this budget, accelerating investments to bring funding 
spending in 23-24 up to $569 million, including nearly $300 million to support contract rate increases to stabilize the home and community care workforce. This funding will also expand home care services and improve the quality of care, making it easier and faster for people to connect to care. Having strong Response. home and community care for people like Barbara is a key part of this government's plan for connected and convenient care. The next question, the member for Niagara West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. The people of my riding of Niagara West have seen firsthand the devastating consequences of mental health challenges and addictions in Niagara. We've seen the losses from these challenges, and we know that the losses are devastating for loved ones and have a significant impact on our broader community. Our government is committed to building awareness and reducing stigma related to mental health and addiction challenges. And I know that through investments in community supports, progress has been made. But the demand for services in my riding and so many others continues at an unprecedented rate. And our government must act to ensure that Ontarians are able to get access to the care they need when and where they need it. Speaker, could the Associate Minister please explain to this House what our government is doing to ensure that all individuals facing mental health challenges and addictions care are being supported here in the province of Ontario. The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member, the fantastic member from Niagara West. This gives you an opportunity to speak about the investments that we're making in our new budget and uh, how we're going to help those that are doing the heavy lifting in the province fight against the opioid overdoses. Mr. Speaker, with an additional investment of $425 million over three years, we're providing the community mental health and addiction sectors its first base funding increase in 10 years. By providing a 5% increase in funding across the board for community mental health and addictions organizations, we're stabilizing the sector, ensuring staff can be retained and making it clear to the people of Ontario that we're treating these issues with the seriousness they deserve. I want to end this, uh, the, the response with uh, a quote from uh, the CEO from CMHA who said, the budget is an overwhelmingly positive sign that the government understands the strain our sector is facing and we support the Ontarians living with. Thank you. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. The Associate Minister for that response, and I appreciate hearing about the significant inflow of cash into this important sector to ensure that we have are able to hire more staff and address the needs of people in my community to receive the care when and where they need it. I know this is a hugely important issue and one that I'm thankful for the leadership being shown by so many in this budget to ensure that we're funding these services in our areas. It's also important, though, to raise awareness about the urgent need for affordable housing in context uh, where we're trying to support people with mental health and addiction challenges. And one of the most ins uh, important aspects for health uh, for those who are recovering is ensuring that they have adequate access to housing. So I know that as a government, we're taking this need very seriously and we're building more affordable housing across this province. But I'm wondering if the minister could please explain what actions our government is taking to address homelessness and ensure that we're helping vulnerable Ontarians, those who are homeless or at risk of becoming homeless. The minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, the continuum of care and the housing component that we need to have for it to be effective is extremely important. And that's one of the key social determinants of health. We understand that, and that's why I'm so proud that our government is adding over $200 million to the Homelessness Prevention Program to build supportive housing units across the province of Ontario. And Mr. Speaker, we're making significant historic investments to expand mental health and addiction services across the province. At the same time, this investment demonstrates the level of our commitment to ensuring the critical wraparound supports exist for those seeking treatment and recovery. This budget is a win for all Ontarians struggling with mental health and addictions issues. We see you and we're here fighting for you. This government is building a recovery-oriented continuum of care to meet the needs of the people Response. of Ontario, and the investments announced last week will help ensure that those who get better stay better. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, just earlier this week, a constituent of mine, Ton Tonoish Saha, reached out, a student from York University. He was 30 minutes late for his exam. Speaker, despite coming early for the bus, he waited for half an hour extra 
and then he was 30 minutes late for his exam. That's just a small example of the reality in Scarborough when it comes to transit because of the delays that we're facing. And with recent cuts to TTC, bus 905 and 9 will have more overcrowding, more wait times, more delays, and it, put, it puts so many people in Scarborough in an unfair disadvantage, unlike others. And this is because of the cuts that we are seeing from our governments when it comes to transit. So my question is simple, Speaker. What do you say to Tonoi and so many people who feel that they're at an unfair disadvantage and the fact that we're not setting these people up for success? To reply, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for her question. And what I say to the people of her riding is that residents of Scarborough deserve the same level of transit as the, as the rest of the City of Toronto, which is why our government has put forward a plan to have a three-stop subway in Scarborough. But, Mr. Speaker, that member opposite and her party voted against it. You know, Mr. Speaker, our government has put forward measure after measure to support transit expansion and the operation of transit in the GTA. But time after time, Mr. Speaker, whether it's safe restart funding or whether it's capital projects for new transit in the City of Toronto, the members of the opposition consistently vote against it. No, no, so, no. Mr. Speaker, they can't have it both ways. Either Order. they're for more transit and Response. they vote with us, or they're just against it. Yeah. Supplementary. Speaker, I would like to invite the minister to come to Scarborough and walk with me, because my, my, my area that I'm talking about it has six ridings and three subway stations does not do justice, Speaker. And there are members from this side, of the government side as well, who are in Scarborough who could do better for their constituents. And Tonoi and many other students who wait for, for so many minutes, for hours, for their buses, for their trains, would not be satisfied with that answer, Speaker. My question again, Speaker. The, the experts, the advocates for transit are calling for, the, for more operating budget increase from this government. We are seeing an increase in violence in our TTC, in our transit system right now. That is exacerbated because of the cuts. We need to invest and address the root causes of these problems. So my question is, Speaker, will this minister and her government invest in the operating budget that was cut by the Liberals and now exacerbated by this government as well, Speaker? Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'm very proud of the record of our government in supporting the operation of transit systems. In fact, Mr. Speaker, I don't think there's been a government in Ontario history that's done more to, so to support the operation of transit systems. Throughout the pandemic, Order. under the leadership of our Premier, we put more than $2 billion into the operation of transit systems across this province. Why? Because we know that transit is essential. During the pandemic, it was essential to getting our workers to and from home to work safely, Mr. Speaker. And so we put billions of dollars, and the number one beneficiary of our Safe Restart funding, Mr. Speaker, was the TTC. We have been there every step of the way, but sadly, Mr. Speaker, for the constituents of the, in the ridings of the members opposite, they all voted against that critical support that we provided for transit. Mr. Speaker, we're continuing to build transit in the city of Toronto, including. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Kitchener Conestoga. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, my question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Yeah. Animals and animal related agriculture are crucial to the economic stability of Ontario's rural and remote communities. However, many regions across the province are experiencing a shortage of veterinarians who care for livestock, and this shortage puts a strain on the entire agricultural system. Unfortunately, there are service gaps in rural, remote, and northern Ontario that put farmers and their operators at a disadvantage. These gaps create risk to farmers and their livestock, as well as jeopardizing the security of our food supply chains. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting veterinary care to underserviced regions of this province? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I really appreciate that thoughtful question from the member from Kitchener-Conestoga, because it's important to recognize that our government understands that to keep our agri-food supply chain strong, farmers across this province need confidence in the fact that they have services when they need it and where they need it. And that's why I am 
losing my voice because I am <laughs> talking so much about the amazing partnership that we have with the Ministry of Colleges and Universities, as well as my ministry at OMAFRA. With the support of our cabinet colleagues, we have introduced a new program. It's a collaborative program whereby the University of Guelph and Lakehead University are establishing a collaborative doctor of veterinary medicine. And this is going to be a two plus two program where we're going to see 20 more veterinary students per year look at the first two years at Lakehead University, the follow-up two years at University of Guelph. This is an initiative that is demonstrating that to grow a strong Thank you. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, and I, I want to thank you, but I also want to thank my uncle Chuck Lockton, who has been a large animal vet, uh, not just here in Ontario, but also in Alberta, and was also a member of the Canadian Food Inspection wow. Agency and has done so much great work for our farmers across uh, this great country. And it is encouraging to see our government's commitment to funding investments <laughs> that will increase enrollment in veterinary medicine programs to support Ontario's livestock farmers, Mr. Speaker. The need for large animal veterinarians is pressing for many communities across our, pro across our province. Therefore, it is essential that our government steps up to implement measures to recruit re and retain veterinarians across Ontario. As a government, we must do all that we can to support our farmers. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate more on how this veterinary medicine incentive program will assist rural, remote, and northern communities? For agriculture, food, and rural affairs. I love the opportunity to stand up and share my appreciation for everyone that has made this happen. Because we, on Monday we just hosted our second annual Grow Ontario Food Summit, and everybody was buzzing about the fact that we've listened and we've taken action. But we're doing more over and above that collaborative partnership between Lakehead University and University of Guelph. Our PA, the member from Elgin, Middlesex, and London, is reviewing the Vet Act. And over and above the program introduced, we're, we're making sure students are incented. So we've introduced an additional $5 million program that's going to incent and reward people for pursuing a career in large animal veterinary medicine. This is a crisis that we've identified. We're taking action, and this particular incentive program is going to see students who are large animal vets be receiving $50,000 over five years for working in remote and underserviced areas in rural and northern Ontario. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Toronto, Danforth. Speaker, thank you. My question to the Minister of Transportation. The playground at Pape School in my riding is about to become an Ontario line construction site, construction that will go on for two years. Parents are worried that their children, who lost two years of schooling during the pandemic, will face another lost two years unless, unless there is adequate protection to keep noise levels in the classrooms at an acceptable level. Will the minister direct Metrolink to use Met World Health Organization standards for acceptable noise levels in the classrooms? Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for his question. Um, I agree we have to make sure that uh, all precautions are taken to preserve um, the safety of the playground at the Pape Avenue Junior Public School, and I want to assure the parents there that uh, my ministry is well aware of their concerns and the issues. To date, Mr. Speaker, all work around the school has focused on ground and on soil investigation, on utility locating, and on surveying. But we have full confidence that Metrolinx will be able to ensure that all safety standards are followed. Metrolinx is actively working with the TDSB, with the principal of the school and the parent council to create a construction safety management plan and has been conducting regular site visits and safety reviews. Mr. Speaker, a construction liaison committee, a CLC, has been created and has held two meetings to date to discuss upcoming construction activities, safety, and any additional community concerns that have Response. been raised. Mr. Speaker, we are taking these concerns very seriously. We want to make sure that the school, the environment around the school is safe, and we will be working closely with community leaders and parents on this issue. And the supplementary question. Speaker, the PAPE parents support the construction of the Ontario line. They're the people who have been stuck in PAPE subway station waiting as train after train has passed. They know that we need transit. But so far, Metrolinx will not make a firm commitment to the target that will be met 
in the classrooms so that children don't go through another two years of disruption. What I'm asking the Minister, Speaker, is to tell Metrolinx to set a standard that they will be held to that will trigger action if it is over, it has gone over, because the children need to have a restoration of normality. It can be done. It will require investment, but we need to have an agreed standard. World Health Organization is the right one to protect the children and protect the learning environment. Yeah. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm happy to tell the parents of the Pape Avenue Junior School that we are following standards. We are following Ontario standards. Mr. Speaker, we have prepared a draft health and safety plan that was distributed to the CLC in advance of the last meeting on March 28th to allow the school and attendees time to review the plan that we've put forward and to discuss it at that meeting. But to further mitigate noise concerns, Mr. Speaker, we've committed to placing a noise barrier around the school. And upcoming work has been detailed to the, stu the, the school uh, parent council. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure families that Metrolinx is committed to ensuring that the highest levels of safety standards are maintained throughout construction, because we all agree the Ontario line needs to be built. It will take 28,000 cars off Spons? the road each and every day. That is essential for future generations, and Mr. Speaker, we will get it done. The next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Over the past few years, women have experienced hardship as a result of economic insecurity, a greater burden on caregiving responsibilities, and a rise, a sadly, a rise in incidents of domestic violence. Combined together, these social and economic barriers are significant challenges for many women as they find their economic independence. Women need to be able to connect to supports to develop their skills knowledge and experience in, in order to find a job or start a small business. It's essential that our government takes action to address the unique, disproportionate barriers that women face when entering the job market. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain how our government is supporting women, not just to gain employment, but to increase their financial security? The Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for her question and the work she's doing to help keep women safe in Ontario. It has been a challenging, it has been a challenging road to recovery for many women since the onset of the pandemic, but we want all women to know that we are on their side and we're not going to waver from that support for them. That is why earlier this week I was proud to announce that with my colleague, the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training, Skills Development, and the member from Newmarket Aurora, that our government is, is expanding the Investing in Women Futures program. And we announced 10 new locations in Ontario, and I'm excited about the continued progress that is to come. Our government will continue to assess women who have experienced social Response. and economic barriers to access services, develop skills needed to gain financial security, and live safely with a greater sense of security. This program expansion will help more women across the province access life-changing services that will put them in the driver's seat of their economic future. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister. I also want to thank her for coming to my riding on numerous occasions to meet with young women who were interested in the, in the skilled trades and how, what the barriers were to get them to stay in that job. And, and they were such wonderful women, and you just were magnificent at those meetings. Magnificent. So thank you. Magnificent. You know, all women should have access to the services they need no matter where they live, particularly in rural and remote communities. Long distance and travel are barriers for many women to connect to the sports they need, and that was one thing that was brought up in our conversations. It's essential that there is access to service and supports for women facing economic and social barriers, including those experienced gender-based violence and social isolation. Mr. Speaker, our government must make investments that focus on empowering women to achieve the success they deserve through good-paying jobs. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please elaborate elaborate on how this program encourages overall well-being, safety, and economic independence for women. The Associate Minister. 
you. I, thank you again to the member. Uh, last month when I toured Northern Ontario, I met with women who had struggled to access much needed services due to long distance travel. And Mr. Speaker, women's geographic location should not limit their access to services. It is crucial that we focus on getting the right supports in place for women who need them the most. That is why the expansion of in the Investing in Women's Futures program is particularly important for remote and rural women. The program provides a wide range of flexible services that include access to transportation, developing financial skills, and wraparound supports such as safety planning, business development, and so much more. I am proud of these advancements because Response. I know they will help many women across Ontario, including those in the rural and remote areas, because I truly believe that when women succeed, Ontario succeeds. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. The member for Barry